Decisions We as human beings are met with multiple decisions that we must make on a daily basis. What to wear, what to eat, the list goes on and on. These require little to no thought and carry almost no weight in our everyday lives. Some important decisions, though, can stick with us for a lifetime, adding unwanted stress on top of an already difficult situation. And that added stress can begin to bear down on us. Stress that can have a lasting effect on what we ultimately decide to do. Fortunately for us, though, most difficult decisions we are met with only affect ourselves and maybe a handful of other people in our lives. For the majority, we will rarely, if ever, be met with a decision that can have a lasting impact on dozens of people. But on January 8th of 1904, Captain George Roberts aboard the SS Clallam would be met with a situation that required a decision as such. One that would not only affect him and his life, but one that would also place 56 lives in his hands. These people, along with their countless relatives, would undoubtedly be impacted by his efforts. The stress, coupled with the rising dangers at sea, would leave him to make a decision that would stick with him for the rest of his life. I'm Bradley Hall, and you're listening to Beyond the Harbor. Captain Roberts was no stranger to navigating the waters of Puget Sound, having over 30 years of experience under his belt in the area. The 657-ton, 168-foot steamboat would be met with a severe storm with winds gusting in excess of 40 miles per hour just off the coast of Washington State. But his steamship, the Clallam, was brand new, fast, and regarded as a well-rounded, sea-capable vessel. The ship was traveling from Seattle to Port Townsend, where they would pick up a few more passengers and then disembark to head to their final destination of Victoria, British Columbia. The vessel battled its way through the gale force winds for around 35 miles en route to Victoria Harbor. At about 2 p.m., they were less than three miles out from harbor when chief engineer aboard the Clallam, Scott Delaney, reported to Captain Roberts that the ship was taking water on in the engine room. They found a broken porthole, which was allowing seawater to rush into the engine room. They made every effort they could to stop the flow by using blankets held in place by boards nailed into the walls to try and stop the excessive flooding. But the ship continued to take on water. The watertight compartments kept the problem from spreading, at least initially. However, the flooding was in the worst possible place, the engine boiler room. The coal bunkers were washed with water, spilling their fuel source and crippling the pumps. About an hour later at 3 p.m., Captain Roberts was notified that the water had extinguished the ship's power source. Without steam, this left the, well, steamboat dead in the water. Captain Roberts was then greeted with an unbearably tough decision to make during the storm. Abandon ship and launch the lifeboats or try and wait it out for help to arrive to evacuate the sinking vessel. After quick deliberation, Roberts decided it best to launch the lifeboats and try to save as many on board as he could. As it was still daylight, he believed the lifeboats could safely make it to the shore of Discovery Island, which was only about two miles away. He would order all women and children into the lifeboats to begin their descent down to the frigid waters below. The first lifeboat to launch caught the guardrail on the way down, spilling the women and children into the rough seas where they quickly drowned. The second lifeboat was then launched and cleared the guardrail that the first one had caught. They landed safely in the water and began to paddle to shore. The third lifeboat became tangled on the way down and threw all of the occupants overboard, immediately drowning them in the storm. The second lifeboat had made it roughly 600 feet until a massive wave capsized it, sending everyone overboard. 
All the women and children were drowned in the icy waters. I'm sure the helpless men watched in horror as their wives and children were taken from them, swallowed up by the sea. All in all, there were 56 lives lost in the three lifeboats, an utter catastrophe. As for the remaining crew and passengers on board, they were left in a waiting pattern until further help could arrive. At 10.35 p.m., a tugboat named the Richard Holyoke was captained by Robert Hall and found the Clallam drifting midway between Smith Island and San Juan Island. Captain Robert Hall sailed right up to the Clallam and passed them a towing hauser. Captain Roberts requested a towing to the nearest port. He advised them that the Clallam was taking on water, but he failed to mention that in actuality, it was sinking. At 1 a.m., Captain Roberts notified the Richard Holyoke to let go of the towing hauser. They were going down. He ordered everyone to come on deck and to put on their life belts and prepare to be rescued. As soon as the towing hauser was slackened, the Clallam began to go under, stern first. The ship began to break apart sending their remaining men and crew into the sea. As a stroke of luck, the tugboats were there on standby for rescue and immediately began pulling up survivors from the sunken vessel. Regrettably though, the only lives that the sea claimed that day were those ordered into the lifeboats by Captain Roberts. There was absolutely no way he could have known this would have led to such a disaster as he was only doing what he thought was best. A decision, he thought, would save lives, but ended up claiming the lives of 56 aboard the lifeboats. He undoubtedly would have to live with this decision for the rest of his life. The task that was dealt to Captain Roberts on that fateful day would fortunately be one of those outliers, something that most of us will never have to worry about. And that was the case for the next 14 years until another stormy day in October of 1918 when Captain Locke would face nearly the same exact decision. The SS Princess Sophia was a steel-hulled steamship built for the transportation of passengers, mail, and some other smaller cargo items. The ship ran in a fleet of similar vessels for the Canadian Pacific Railway Company. Their routes were generally on the west coast of Canada and the southeast coast of Alaska. The inside passage was a very popular route taken by these vessels and is still widely utilized to this day. It has stops in six important harbor towns where they can then pick up passengers or cargo to transport on to the next town. The Princess Sophia was no stranger to this passage. It was commissioned in 1911 and had sailed the passage numerous times over the years. When Canada entered the Great War in 1914, Now more widely known as World War I, Princess Sophia was used to ferry troops who were being trained up for service to different locations along her route. In October of 1918, the war in Europe was still raging on. However, the Princess Sophia returned to her regularly scheduled programming of transporting passengers and cargo along the inside passage. On the 23rd day of the month, the vessel was slated to make its last run of the season The Daily Alaskan newspaper had an article out notifying people who may need to get last-minute tickets. It read, quote, Steamer Princess Sophia leaves Skagway, p.m. Tickets take same route to Vancouver, Victoria, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Everett, Bellingham, Anacortes, and Port Townsend, end quote. Sounds like a pretty good last-minute deal if you were needing to get to one of these destinations. Why not take a more luxurious trip on the Sophia, which was equipped with wireless communications and electric lighting? The technology was cutting edge for their time. First class passengers also had several other amenities, including an observation lounge paneled in maple, a social hall with a grand piano, and a 112 seat dining room equipped with large windows for great views of the coastal scenery outside. Needless to say, This wasn't your everyday run-of-the-mill, Greyhound bus type of transportation. This was a modern Marvel commercial liner. The Princess Sophia was loaded down with passengers on the 23rd of October in 1918, ready to make her voyage from Skagway 
to the various stops along the inside passage. On board were 268 passengers, a truly diverse group of people, including miners, government officials, businessmen, and civil servants. Most of them had their wives and children tagging along for the journey. For the crew aboard, there were 75 men, bringing the total number of lives on the Sophia to 343. They were looking to make their way south to escape the harsh winter season about to set in. The winter there would cause ice to block the passages and limit transportation in or out of the towns. They departed Skagway at 10.10 p.m., roughly three hours behind their scheduled departure time of 7 p.m. What caused this delay is unknown, but we've all been there, a minor inconvenience that most of us have experienced while traveling. For this trip, the man at the helm was Captain Leonard Locke. Locke was a veteran to the inside passage route, as he had been sailing in the industry for a little over 25 years. As they pulled out of port, visibility was already very poor. The mix of heavy snow and fog on top of nightfall made for an incredibly difficult time to navigate. Their cruising speed was around 11 knots, which was about 13 miles per hour to give you a reference. Roberts was forced to use a technique known as dead reckoning to keep the vessel on course. Dead reckoning is the process of calculating the current position of the ship from using a known position, such as a port, combined with speed and heading to determine their position over a certain amount of time. However, the technique cannot factor in other variables, such as current and wind, which open the doors to possible miscalculations of their positions. The crew was also blowing whistles and counting the time it would take for the echo to return off the canal walls to be certain of their position on the water. Both of these methods can be very flawed, but satellite navigation wasn't around at the time, so this was the best they had to work with. Under normal conditions, the cruising speed would have been around seven to nine knots, but be it they were already three hours behind schedule, it is believed that Captain Locke was trying to make up some lost ground by keeping the ship's cruising speed at 11 knots. Unbeknownst to the captain and crew, the Sophia was off course by at least one nautical mile. This may not seem like much if you were in an open ocean, but it would make a huge difference in a 6.5 mile wide canal. Around four hours into the trip, Princess Sophia was coming up on Vanderbilt Reef. This was a very large reef that at high tide could be almost invisible and at low tide could rise to almost 12 feet out of the water. The reef was marked with an unlit buoy bobbing about, but factoring in the heavy snow, fog, and nightfall, the buoy should have just stayed at home. At around 2 a.m., now the 24th of October, the drifting Princess Sophia traveling full speed at 11 knots was headed straight for the Vanderbilt Reef. At just 54 miles into the journey from Skagway, Captain Locke plowed the Sophia directly onto the reef below, sending passengers and crew members flying about. Signal Corps Private R.S. McQueen describes the events as it unfolded in a letter. Quote, Two women fainted, and one of them got herself into a black evening dress and didn't worry about who saw her putting it on. Some of the men, too, kept life preservers on for an hour or so and seemed to think there was no chance for us. End quote. Luckily for the passengers, the vessel was equipped with wireless radio, the operator sent out a distress signal shortly after the grounding. At 2.15 a.m., the message would reach the town of Juneau, which was about 36 miles to the south. The local shipping agent was awakened with the news, and he began to organize a rescue attempt with the boats in the harbor. Around 6 a.m., high tide was approaching, and the winds had died down a significant amount, but the Princess Sophia was still stranded. The waves forced the vessel even further onto the reef. Low tide came around lunchtime, and this left the steamship completely out of the water. They then got a chance to inspect the double hull of the ship and noted that it had not been breached to their knowledge. Captain Locke would be greeted with an important decision to make. With rescue boats circling nearby and high tide coming in again around 4 p.m., 
he could either make an attempt at dropping the lifeboats or try to have the ship tugged off the reef, possibly damaging the hull. Dropping the lifeboats at low tide would simply strand them on the rock, and dropping them at high tide could possibly leave the huge swells to throw them about. Undoubtedly, Captain Locke had heard of the story of the SS Clallam and the terrible fate that it was met with when Captain Roberts had dropped all three lifeboats, only to have all the passengers drown right before their eyes. This had to have weighed heavily on Locke's decision making. He then decided to wait and try and have the vessel tugged off and have everyone remain in their quarters until further notice. A couple of fishing vessels, the Estabeth and Amy, had been circling Vanderbilt Reef while the storm raged on. Captain James Davis was aboard the Estabeth, looking on at the stranded Sophia and noticed that it had taken some pretty severe damage to the bow. He noted there was a large hole that was allowing water to rush in and out of it. He estimated it at around 200 or 300 gallons per minute. With the current weather conditions, there was nothing he could do to assist them until the waves died down. Captain Locke was so confident in the safety of the Sophia that he used a megaphone to notify the captains of the fishing vessels to seek shelter at a nearby harbor because of the pounding they were taking from the storm. This was again another decision he made not to evacuate given the unstable weather conditions. There was another vessel located about 66 nautical miles away from Vanderbilt Reef that had received word at about 2 p.m. of the grounding. Captain J.W. Ledbetter was in command of the USS Cedar, a ship that served as a patrol vessel in World War I. He turned the Cedar toward the reef and headed in a rescue attempt of the passengers aboard the Sophia. He sent a wireless message asking Captain Locke if he wanted to try and evacuate some passengers that night when he arrived at 8 p.m. Captain Locke again declined, stating that the wind and tide were too strong and it would be better for the rescue ships to anchor and wait until daylight. The passengers and crew aboard the Sophia had to settle in for a frigid, storm-ridden night above the Vanderbilt Reef. There would be no rescue attempts made on October 24th. It was time for the rescue ships to regroup and discuss a plan to safely evacuate the passengers aboard the Sophia. Captain Ledbetter on board the USS Cedar being the only ship with wireless communication capabilities, would head up the rescue effort plan. After viewing the beating and battering of the waves on the vessel during high tide, Ledbetter and Locke both agreed that the passengers would be safer aboard the vessel as opposed to attempting to launch the lifeboats. This would be the third time Captain Locke made the decision not to launch the lifeboats, deeming it safer for the passengers to remain on board. By the next morning at 9 a.m. on the 25th of October, the winds of the storm were reaching gale force strength of around 40 miles per hour. Captain Ledbetter would return to the Sophia, trying to anchor his ship about 500 yards downwind of Vanderbilt Reef. He planned on shooting a line to the Sophia in an attempt to rescue passengers by way of Breach's buoy. This plan admittedly was not great, as the storm was swirling and the rescue buoy could only carry one passenger at a time. It would take many hours to complete this evacuation, but they were all out of ideas by this point. However, Captain Ledbetter had difficulties trying to drop anchor. He tried twice and each time the anchor failed to catch the bottom. Captain Locke on the Sophia could see the failed attempts that Ledbetter was making and radioed to him that it was no use and they should wait for low tide when conditions could have a chance at being more favorable. At this point, there was nothing else that could be done with the storm raging on. There is no doubt that the Princess Sophia was facing dire circumstances on the Vanderbilt Reef. Stick around a minute and we will unpack her untimely fate during that raging early winter storm. By 1 p.m. on October 25th, the weather conditions were still steadily getting worse. I'm sure at this point, everyone involved was just begging for a slight break in the elements. 
Captain Ledbetter radioed Locke aboard the Sophia and asked for his permission to retire to a more protected area as their ship was getting tossed around in the terrible waves. Locke agreed, so the Cedar, along with another ship, the King and Wing, sailed back to Sentinel Island, where the two captains could discuss yet another rescue plan. They had both came to what I feel like would be a pretty good rescue plan. However, as luck would have it, for it to be successful, they would need the weather to cooperate. It was simply too dangerous to attempt during the current given conditions. At 4.50 p.m., Ledbetter received a message from the Princess Sophia that read, quote, Ship foundering on reef. Come at once. Ledbetter made plans to head out to the reef immediately and notified Captain Miller aboard the King and Wing. Miller said he would give him about an hour to locate them. At 5.20 p.m., Ledbetter would receive the final distress message from the Princess Sophia. It was sent by wireless operator David Robinson. It read, quote, for God's sake, hurry. The water is coming into my room. Knowing the ship needed to conserve battery power, Ledbetter told them only to transmit a message if absolutely necessary. Robinson messaged back saying, All right, I will. You talk to me so I know you are coming. Tragically, though, this would be the last message sent from the Princess Sophia. The Cedar simply could not make it back to Vanderbilt Reef. It was getting hammered by the wind and snow, and they could not see more than a few feet in front of them. This made it extremely dangerous for the Cedar to navigate the waters. Captain Ledbetter risked running the ship aground in a rescue attempt. He had to make the difficult decision to return to harbor amid the exhaustive snowstorm. And what a difficult one it must have been for him, especially after what was to come. The next morning on October 26th, the storm had ceased enough to where Captain Ledbetter could get the Cedar to the Vanderbilt Reef. The only thing that remained of Princess Sophia was her foremast sticking out of the water a few feet. The Princess Sophia, sadly, had succumbed to the treacherous winter storm. The rescue vessels began to circle around the reef in search of any survivors, but all they managed to come up with were floating bodies and the passengers' belongings. Ledbetter then sent out a wire message that said, quote, No sign of life. No hope of survivors. Some of the bodies that were recovered had watches that noted the time of the sinking at 5.50 p.m. the day before on the 25th, only 30 minutes after the final wire message. As there were no witnesses or no survivors from the sinking, only an investigation could attempt to reconstruct the events that unfolded during the time the Princess Sophia sank. Many people had life jackets on, unable to survive the frigid waters. Others still remained in their cabins, and some choked to death on the oil from the ship that was leaking out into the water. For months after the sinking, bodies continued to wash ashore along with the passengers' belongings. Some bodies were found ashore as much as 30 miles away truly a very tragic and sad ending for those aboard the Princess Sophia. Unless you are from the area, it is unlikely that you have ever heard of the sinking of the Princess Sophia. I had gone my whole life without hearing of what is now dubbed as the unknown Titanic of the West Coast. There are several reasons as to why, though. The newspapers at the time were littered with information about the freshly signed armistice, ending the Great War in Europe. This, coupled with a growing fear of Spanish influenza, seemed to bury the tragic story of the Princess Sophia and the perishing of all 343 lives aboard. I'm going to leave you with a letter written by John R. Maskell, who was aboard the Princess Sophia during the journey. The letter was later recovered from his body when it washed ashore a few days after the sinking. This letter brings the realization of the tragedy to life and that these were real people who experienced a truly tragic event just a little over a century ago. Shipwrecked off coast of Alaska, SS Princess Sophia, October 24th, 1918. 
Quote, My own dear sweetheart, I am writing this, my dear girl, while the boat is in grave danger. We struck a rock last night, which threw many from their berths. Women rushed out in their night attire. Some were crying, some too weak to move. But the lifeboats were swung out in all readiness. But owing to the storm would be madness to launch, until there was no hope for the ship. Surrounding ships were notified by wireless, and in three hours the first steamer came, but cannot get near to owing to the storm raging, and the reef which we are on. There are now seven ships near. When the tide went down, two-thirds of the boat was high and dry. We are expecting the lights to go out at any minute, also the fires. The boat might go to pieces, for the force of the waves are terrible making awful noises on the side of the boat, which has quite a list to port. No one is allowed to sleep, but believe me, dear Dory, it might have been much worse. Just here, there is a big steamer coming. We struck the reef in a terrible snowstorm. There is a big buoy near the marking of the danger, but the captain was to port instead of to starboard of the buoy. I made my will this morning, leaving everything to you, my own true love, And I want you to give 100 pounds to my dear mother, 100 pounds to my dear dad, 100 pounds to dear wee Jack, and the balance of my estate of about 300 pounds to you, dear Dory. The Eagle Lodge would take care of my remains. In Danger at Sea, J. Maskell. This episode was written and produced by me, Bradley Hall. If you enjoyed this story as we explored the history of the SS Clallam and Princess Sophia, please be sure to like, rate, and subscribe. You can find us on Instagram by searching for Beyond the Harbor. Questions, comments, and feedback can be left at my website. As always, if you are looking to take a deeper dive into this story, the source material used for this episode can be found on my website. Thanks for listening.